Hello and welcome back to part three. I don't know how many parts this is going to be in, it's been a long journey. But part three of the how I became and why I became a prostitute. Now, I do get questioned. I'm, near, I'm now 68 years of age, nearly 69. And this is what I used to look like before. The lights aren't very good. But that's what I was like in my middle to late 30s. Very well toned. Good body, big willy. Now, the one question that asked, I'm asked a lot is that how did I manage to pay tax? How did I hide all my income? Well, as a self-employed man, so I didn't need to hide it. I just declared it. And uh, I had an accountant and a bookkeeper and showed my books at the end of the year and paid my tax. I'd rather do that than hide. Plus a lot of escorts, a lot of masseurs, male or female, at the end of a certain period of time, they've saved so much money and they don't know what to do with it other than spend it on cars, holidays, clothes, food, spoiling their friends. They waste it all and they don't save anything because they don't know how to how to maintain that. When you're legitimate, as I was, it helps. You just pay some tax and you don't have to worry about being you know, hunted down by the tax people or... Uh, as a lot of escorts, they're claiming unemployment and housing benefit and advertising. And that's cheeky. And they are busted. I've known a few who got busted and one was sent to prison for three years. So you have to be sensible. Don't screw the system, especially if you're earning good money. Now, I was investigated for over three years. It was three years because for two and a half years the tax people were moving offices and I didn't bother to tell anybody and you're sitting there panicking for three years thinking what the fuck is going on and then they charge you interest on the money for that three and a half, three years which was cheeky because it was their fault they took so long. Anyway, I had to go and meet with the tax man one day. Huge office on Ken High Street in Kensington and um, we sat apart across the desk from each other and uh, I said to him, you don't know what I do for a living, really, do you? And he went, no, not really. We need to discuss it. So I did. I went into details about how I'm an hour with the client. Um, not in detail about what I did, but that I was an escort, a prostitute, and I'm an hour with the client. And he sort of, silly fool, he went, well, well, in that case, I think I'll put you down for a 40-hour week. I said, I have to perform in my business. Do you think I could perform 40 times a week? I don't think I could do that in my 20s, let alone in my 40s. Now, to him, performing means having a fuck. To most people, having a fuck is coming. Now, you may be fucking somebody, but you're not coming. I'm not coming. I can fuck for England. Hours and not come if I want. So it was very used. Plus, you've got a condom on anywhere, which takes away 85% of the feeling. So it was actually quite good for me not to be able to come as easily because then I could go on to the next and the next. I could fake it. Very easily fake it if the client wanted to. But then so you're not coming. So with the tax man assuming that you're coming with every client, he suddenly got my point of view with, you know, 40 clients a week. I don't think I could have done that at 20, let alone 40. I don't know what it was, 43 or 44. And he got my point of view. He understood. But on my private income account, not the business income, there was a large amount of money going in in lots of different periods on one year, like seven years prior to when this investigation was being held. And I needed to prove what that was or he would take he it, would as, take it business as business money, money. Into my, not private income. And he would take it then for all years. And I was in shit street. I couldn't prove this. It was years ago. All my accounts, all my bookkeeping stuff, all my checkbook and bank statements would have been with my accountant on that year, seven years prior. Yes, you get them back, but I don't keep that sort of stuff. And every Anyway, I didn't have a clue. That night, in my bedside drawer, which is full of crap, like most people's bedside drawers, was this paying-in book. And there was no way that that paying-in book should have been there. It was, would have been with my files, it would have been in my office, it would have been with the, the accountant, and it would have been filed away. But there it was, top of the drawer, and it answered absolutely everything to do with these monies. I'd helped an elderly lady friend with her rent when her husband died, and I'd paid her rents for her, and as the 
housing benefit. People paid it back. They paid it back in stupid amounts. They couldn't do it the same each week. It was Anyway, I was able to prove what it was, get bank statements from this lady friend, produce it all to the tax man, and even he was like, well done, Mr. Bellamy. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. It answers all my questions. And it's like, as I said before, about the pieces of the puzzle in my life have always somehow fallen into place. And every time I've had those moments where I've thought, oh, shit, something, someone, something has happened to rescue. And there's no way that that checkbook, or that paying in book, should have been on my in my bedside drawer. No way. But somehow it got there and it helped and it answered all the questions. So I had a tax bill. I had a, I think it was about a £23,000 tax bill, but this is going back to the mid-90s. And um, my accountant, which I didn't know, had not necessarily been that honest. And I've always insisted on being honest. I don't like liars. I don't like to cheat people. I don't want to you know that someone could have something over me. It's very difficult being in the sex industry anyway, because you're always worried about being busted by the police, the vice squad. Um, clients do like to play games with your head. They really like to play games with your head. I was stalked for three years by somebody and I had to get a whistle eventually. And it was a telephone stalker. He telephoned me 20 times, 30 times a day. I had to get a whistle and blow down the phone to stop him. And there are ways of learning how to cope with the harassment and the abuse you get shoved in your way. And there is a lot of abuse from a lot of very fucked up people out there. And they call me the whore, the low life, the, the tramp, whatever. And yet you've got people in good jobs with good responsible lives who like to fuck around and mess with people's heads mess with their money. It's like the rent boys on the streets in Piccadilly. Now I knew a few of them and one of them, it wasn't my world, it was a different world to me but I knew some of them and one of them one day had been thumped by a client and not paid. Now he was a, a kid on the street, he relied on that money to buy his dinner and pay for some sort of accommodation for the night, he had nowhere to live, his parents were dead, he was about 18 years of age. I kept offering him more help than, he, than I was really sensible in doing but he wasn't willing to take it that's fine but if if a client fucked with him and, and beat him up and took his money that boy needed the money steal a hundred quid from me i'm not gonna like it but it's no big deal when you're earning 50 60 70 thousand a year i can write that off it's just an hour of my time wasted i'll, I'll be annoyed but it's not gonna ruin my life but for a young kid on the street whether it's a boy or a girl and they get so much abuse from the clients, these fucked up people who want to take out their grief of their life, their lack, their unhappiness, and they want to take it out on the escort, the girls or the boys, and boy, they do. And it's so unfair. And as I've always said to all my escort friends, be strong. Strong and know your own guidelines, your own personality, and do not let others treat you less. And if they do, go tell them to fuck off. No one has the right to talk to me or anybody else as a low life. No one. I don't care what your job is, whether you're a pauper or, pope, or, pope, or the Pope. Um, in fact, I'd rather talk to the pauper than the Pope. I'd rather talk to the ordinary man in the street than the... Borises of the Borises of the world, the bumbling idiots or the Trumps of the world, the bloody idiot and the people who think they're intelligent and clever and actually the dumb shits. Dumb shits. So that's the end of part three. We're going to uh, get back onto this a little later on when I can think what else to share with you. There's plenty more. So please subscribe. It's very important. It's, it does help and ring that little bell thing that you get notifications when a new video goes up. We're putting up lots of little ones too, little, little fun ones of the dog and whatever goes on around here. It's a learning curve. The second part of this talk, we accidentally deleted and had to do it all over again. And when you've done something once and you have to repeat it, it's not always so easy. Even for me, who likes to talk a lot. Me? Talk a lot? Never. Keep in touch. If you want to put any, any uh, comments below, please do. Enjoy your comments. And uh, we'll see you soon. Subscribe.